and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Dotsie Bao. She actually travels a lot around the states, spreading the good word about going dairy-free. And you were in Washington, D.C. last week, right, Dotsie? Yes. Yeah, it was a great trip. It was... Um it, I did something that I've never done before, and I guess you could almost consider it lobbying. So I felt kind of special. Uh, I don't know if I should or not, but it just seemed cool. Uh, I was uh, on Capitol Hill in the Rayburn Building, uh, which is where a lot of the congressmen and women are, and I got to meet with Representative Grace Ming uh, from New York. And I only had 15 minutes to meet with her. Uh, so I was very prepared, <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, almost like I was giving a, a, a speech, but it, it turned into just a, a wonderful, robust conversation. Uh, it was there specifically to um, ask her to consider uh, voting to remove uh, dairy as a food group from human for humans, because <laughs> it's good for cows, um, from the USDA dietary guidelines, which will be released in, in 2020, and they will stand for five years. They only review um, U.S. dietary guidelines every five years, which I didn't know. I just assumed it was every year, but it's only every five years. And so I was there to ask her to uh, do that. And if we um, are not successful or, or it's not possible to get them removed, which obviously is it's going to be a bit tough <laughs> because of big industry, I asked um, her to vote to at least have a warning label on all uh, dairy foods, just like we do on um, the side of cigarette packs. Oh. Um, and so I, I was there to uh, share with her and educate her and inform her on the health hazards of dairy, which she really knew nothing about and uh, was really um, entranced in, 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 in learning. She, she was really interested and very curious and asked a lot of questions. And at the end of our time together, uh, had some questions about how she might start making the switch herself. Wow. So awesome. it was effective 15 minutes, I think. So we'll see. But anyway. Well, listen, Canada has removed yep. uh, milk, mm -hmm. eggs too? Dairy. Dairy completely, d m milk and eggs then from there. I don't know about plate? eggs, actually. That's what, what I, 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 I'm not just definitely dairy. Dairy, oh, dairy. is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I was conflating eggs, putting eggs in the dairy thing because it's always in the dairy. Yeah. But no. Yeah. I feel like I still saw that on their um, their their plate. Um, but I could be wrong, but, but I know for sure dairy is gone from, yeah. as a food for human beings. Bye-bye. Yeah. yeah. Great, Great precedence that was set by the by Canadians. Canada. Yeah. We need to follow. Well, since we're talking about food, actually, uh, I want to introduce our guest mm. today. Awesome. He's a really interesting man. I'm very um, excited for our listeners to learn a lot about he's at the forefront of food and, and the plant-based movement. Um, his name is David Welch, and he has had a passion for plants his whole life. David is a plant biologist who is now the Director of Science and Technology at the Good Food Institute, which is a nonprofit that promotes plant-based meat, dairy, and eggs, as well as clean meat, which is also known as cultured meat. And we'll talk a lot about that because I'm sure a lot of our listeners, that's a, a new, new terms for them. David is also an ultra runner with a lot of 50 and 100 milers under his belt, races with names like the Beast Series and Hellbender. <laughs> He's also a running coach, um, primarily for plant-based athletes. And David, his wife, and his three boys are all plant-based. Welcome, David, to our show. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, David, tell, tell us what inspired you to go vegan in the first place. Yeah, I, um, I read a book, I guess, about six and a half years ago um, by Scott Jurek called Eat and Run. Um, if you've not read it, you should. It's an excellent book. You should have him on your podcast. Actually. We will. We will. Yes, yes, yes. Tell, yes. tell our listeners who Scott Jurek is. He is one of the, um, well, he, he doesn't run races anymore, but one of the foremost ultra runners, of at least in the U.S. He, he's won Western States, I think, like six or seven times. Um, all of the big uh, ultra distance marathon races, he's, he's won or uh, finished in the top. Um, and he recently... I think that was three years ago, set the Appalachian Trail speed record, which has since been beaten, but he's done incredible things with his just his two feet and has been plant-based, plant um, I think, pretty much his entire life. Um, yeah, he was one of the first first myth busters about plants. If you just didn't eat meat, that you'd be weak because he was out there for hours and hours beating out all those meat eaters and dairy eaters. Yeah. And he yeah. has an Appalachian Trail uh, record. No, yes, Appalachian Trail, yeah. 
he did. Um, yes. He, and I think I think two people have beaten it since then. But um, he he wrote a book about it called North, which is yeah. a fantastic read. Um, both of his books are, are great. But that first book really, um, I had just finished the Baltimore Marathon, and it hadn't gone well. My training hadn't gone that well. Um, wasn't recovering well after you know long runs and hard workouts. And then I read his book and thought, well, this sounds like a better. Uh, a better path, right? I should, uh, maybe I should try this thing. Um, and the first thing I did was remove dairy. And um, it was like, a, it was almost instantaneous how much better I felt. Um, just, you know, recovery in general, I just felt better, uh, but also recovering from workouts and, and races improved. Um, and then I just kind of eliminated all the other animal products after that. Um, and then started to learn more about uh, many of the other benefits of, um, of eating plants, which has kind of uh, moved me in the direction that I am now with my, the work I do. So, and your, your family um, also started to eliminate meat and dairy from their diet, because your son Tyler especially uh, was very much helped by getting rid of dairy, is that correct? Yeah, so he's he's our middle uh, child. He's now almost eight. Uh, he'll be eight later this year. And um, he used to be kind of the weakest of the the three. He would get, you know, when he'd get colds and or the flu, which he got far more frequently back then, um, he'd get terrible like GI issues. And after I had this this such a profound um, effect from removing dairy from from my um, diet, um, and I. You know, it's strange being a being a scientist. You would think that I would know all of the you know the the things that we know now about dairy and why it's bad, but I just had no idea. I assumed it was healthy like everyone else, and um, and then I you know my wife and I talked and I said, why don't we just try um, removing dairy? And it was the same. It was like a really like an overnight um, uh, transition. And he's now so strong and healthy. Um, you know, just like the other two, they rarely get, um, they get colds and things once in a while, but far less frequently than they used to. And he just doesn't have any of those issues anymore. He's a really strong and happy um, little boy. So um, sometimes I feel a little bad that we fed him dairy for the first couple of years <laughs> of his life, but unknowingly. Um, and But now, um, yeah, we're so happy that he was able to change so uh, so drastically too. As a scientist, um, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, research matters, specific kinds of research matter, numbers matter to you. Um, and I would assume that you just really didn't, there was just never really an impetus to look behind uh, closed doors at any kind of dairy research uh, pro or con uh, because it just was a perpetuated belief like for the rest of us, like, oh, this is a good food, so I'll just... But when you did, can you talk about what, when you peel back the layers on the research, what you have found um, from a, well, we could talk about from both sides, like what you have found and, and some of the issues that you might have with the dairy research. Like I get really frustrated with the controls they use. Uh, so maybe about that. And then also the research that you know about that's, that's showing us how bad it is for human beings. Yeah, I mean, one of the first things, so I had this this transformation and then my family did, and, I, and then I started to want to learn more about um, plant-based eating, but also the harms of eating animals. Um, and one of the first things I did was take the um, T. Colin Campbell um, course, nutrition course, like many people, um, just to kind of... We both did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which good. was excellent. And then you kind of, it, it takes you off in so many directions. But just learning about, um, you know, you just have, I had these general assumptions that, you know, milk has calcium and it has um, lots of protein and all of those things are really good. But you, you don't learn about the, you don't, you're not aware of the differences between um, proteins and the impacts that like IGF-1 can have on uh, on tumor formation, for example, or that there's plenty of calcium in it, but because of the, the way milk is uh, structured, a lot of that leaches from, from your body, right? So it's not actually doing um, what it's supposed to be doing and taking in calcium from say leafy greens uh, is far more effective than, than calcium, which is one of the main reasons that people think milk is healthy or dairy products are healthy is because of the calcium in there. So it was just, it was um, revelationary for me just to learn. Uh, there's so much 
information that's just not put out in the public. And then to look at, then you start to look at some of the, you know, the studies that are put out there, particularly for athletes and Dr. you and I have talked about this, right? Some of the chocolate milk stuff that's out there that many athletes assume is such a great recovery drink. And then you look into the studies and you see who funds it um, and how their controls are done. And it's just all, a lot of it is very suspect data um, that drives a lot of these messages that are supposedly um, centered around science by by the dairy industry. And that the chocolate milk study that David's speci- specifically mentioning, well, there's a few, but the one that, that, that got me so in, enraged, just because I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not truthful, um, and it makes people think something that, that isn't the case, that chocolate milk is the perfect recovery, fuel, drink, whatever you want to call it for athletes, that's what they say, and when they did uh, the research to, I guess, try and approve that or have something to stand behind it, they did it in the sports of rock climbing and judo, and the cr- control that they used Uh, In other words, what they compared it to was water. And there isn't a single solitary person on the planet that would think, oh, well, they compared it to water, though. So, no, you would just make an assumption that they maybe compared it to something that would be on its level. That had Calories would be a good start, right? Because you're going to be better off probably with a mouthful of dirt uh, (laughs) because that at least has some calories and some B vitamins, right? Um, So uh, that is incredibly misleading. Because it wasn't compared to, or, or even, a, you know, a, a plant-based milk or even Gatorade for Pete's sake. Just something that could actually uh, have an element in it that would help an athlete repair. So anything you put in your mouth is going to help you repair uh, a little bit better uh, than water, um, except for maybe your hydration. <laughs> no, she's exactly right. Now, you, ta- you are a scientist, so you, I m- imagine that you look at the world with a, sort of a logical um, a log- your logical mind comes first. What were the things that you saw in yourself that convinced you that you this was a smart move to go vegan? I, you, so you mentioned your recovery, but um, I've read read several blog posts that you've you've done, and you you listed a whole host of things that happened after you went plant based. Yeah, I mean, some of the sort of just general things I noticed that I was, I mean, I. I I assume that I'm lactose intolerant, like many people in the world, um, because I just was like less bloated, less uncomfortable. Um, I used to eat like yogurt every, every pretty much every day for breakfast, and I, I wasn't a big milk drinker, but I ate a lot of cheese because I thought it was good for me. Um, and I just, I felt better. I, I just in general, I wouldn't get as uh, ill as frequently when I did get ill prior to becoming vegan, I used to get like terrible sinus pains and um, awful headaches, those disappeared. Um, So my overall health improved, you know, markers like cholesterol um, went down. And but then my running was just, um, you know, before I would go out for a long run, and I would need a couple of days to feel like I could go and do another um, significant run again. And after removing dairy, um, specifically, that just disappeared. I could go out and uh, I would come back from a run and feel great um, and still have a lot of energy. And the next day, my legs would be fine. I'd be you know, able to do, if I wasn't running, I'd be able to, be able to do other stuff and not feel um, tired and, and wiped out, which is if you're training for a longer races like marathons or above that's you know super super important yeah and my race times improved as well so um you know i'm 50 now and i can still um run relatively fast for a for an old guy um and i put a lot of i have five years on you so don't call yourself old (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) and i'm very very young (laughs) um you you wrote this so beautifully you said my diet has evolved from a change based on selfish sports performance improvements to a lifestyle centered around the health of my family, the health of the environment, and the health and happiness of animals. So like, I think that's pretty typical is that we, we make the switch for a reason that often can benefit us very quickly, losing weight or... Mm-hmm. Um, having more energy. Having or, more energy, yeah. health. And then our heart and our mind expands. And I know that happened to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's so, you know, the sort of scientist in me, like I was saying before, it, uh, I wanted to understand 
more about this change I'd seen in myself. So the first thing I did was kind of study the, the health aspects, which we spoke about in the T. Colin Campbell course, and then my family getting all of them, seeing such um, improvements in their, in their health. And then I, then you just start to learn more, right? You, you learn about the animals and how they're treated in this, in our current food system. And it, it seems silly now to um, say that I just didn't realize that that was happening when it's so, um, once you sort of peel back the layers, right, it's, it's so obvious that it, it just makes it so logical that if you're trying to feed so many people around the world with such an inefficient system that you're going to have to house these animals in cruel and, uh, you know, unbelievably cruel conditions. And then you start to learn about the environment, right? That um, animal agriculture is, the UN has said, it's one of the top causes of, of uh, climate change. It, it's, it accounts for 15% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than transport. Um, but who, who, knew, who knows that, right? That um, I would as assume, or I did assume before this, that transport was the main cause of greenhouse gas emissions, but um, it's, you know, animal agriculture is equivalent, if not worse. And you just start to learn all of these things. And that's what really drove me to try and do more work in this area as well, is that there's these huge, uh, massive impacts to our planet and the animals that live on it, both human and uh, non-human, that um, are caused by industrial animal agriculture. Can you just explain um, greenhouse gas emissions? I, I mean, some people know, but some people look at me like I have ten heads. It's like, oh, okay, that's like a fancy word. Is that is that really true? Is that what is it? Do they um, are they heating up our planet because they're destroying our ozone layer? Uh, that's one question, and then a second part to that is, you know. Why was it so cold this winter if the planet's heating up? I, I get that question all the time, and I don't, I don't really know the right answer to that. It's called climate weirding. It's not, it's not, not climate okay. warm. You know, it's not climate warming. Okay. It's climate weirding, right? Yeah, well, so I am not an environmental scientist, so I probably know about the same uh, as you guys. Um, but well, she probably uh, knows more than both of us. Yeah. Maybe, so, maybe we'll I mean, ask her. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the... It, there's various points where the um, this huge industrial animal agriculture system is um, producing gases that are then warming the planet, right? So it's um, it c comes from the animals themselves and the number of animals that we we now keep in these massive facilities, um, and they eat um, grass and other grains, and, they, and then they produce methane and other gases, which then warms the planet. But there's also all the other parts of the, the system, right? Like the transport and the heating of these places and the water use and all of those um, require energy that then produces these um, gas emissions, which further heats the planet. Um, yeah, so it's it's just a combined, um, the combined impact of all of those elements along the entire process of, um, of growing animals for food, which is super inefficient. So I think the main thing about greenhouse gases, it's a different issue than ozone destruction. Okay. Ozone destru the ozone layer does protect uh, the, our um, atmosphere. It keeps it inside so it doesn't go into outer space. And we were destroying that layer by putting in chlorofluorocarbons into it, which, thank goodness, I think it was the Montreal Protocol, there was some agreement, mm -hmm. worldwide agreement, to stop using the aerosol components that were ruining the ozone layer. A major, major environmental feat that we all were able to agree on, and hopefully we can do the same with climate change. What happens with greenhouse gases is that there are several, but methane is the one that cows emit and other livestock through their farts. And it's, a, it's much more powerful than um, carbon dioxide, which is emitted from cars. Um, many times more. And what happens is, is my understanding is, is that the, the layer over that's protecting uh, from f uh, the earth from too much leaving, all that methane bounces uh, against that and then somehow stays in and gets reflected. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's okay. there's too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, it should, and we can't open up the ozone layer and let it out just what we want because other stuff will go out too. Right. And so. because they rumin, cows are ruminant animals and they have several stomachs, and that's why their gases are different than humans because people say that too. Well, we're farting all the time too. It's, it doesn't seem to be a problem. I'm not, but okay. Well, yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> and you said fart, first of all, with just such poise. I mean, I was like, oh, that 
<laughs> you should have had David say it with his English accent. That would have been even better. I, I know. You know, because I hate it when people like beat around the bush. You know, when the we were did with Dr. Neil Barnard, I think I said the word penis three times. And we were like, yeah, just go right to it, girl. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, well. You know, this this kind of awakening that you had brought you to the Good Food Institute. You'd been working with plants as a, as a biologist for a, a long time, through all your career, but it's only recently that you went to the Good Food Institute. Can you tell us what motivated you to do that and, and what, what the Institute does? Yeah. So I, yeah, I did my academic training in, in plant molecular biology, so I have a PhD in that, and um, and then I left academia and moved into um, what's called the life science industry. So I worked for a number of large companies that make tools uh, for scientists to do biological research. Um, a lot of those tools are used like in pharmaceutical companies to study and develop um, new drugs for disease treatment. And much of that time uh, was spent uh, at a company that produced tools for stem cell research and cell therapy research. So I was working with um, stem cells and so-called cell culture media that's used to grow the cells and big um, containers called bioreactors that are, uh, allow large volumes of these cells to be grown. Uh, and this is all used by pharmaceutical companies to develop um, cell-based therapies, which is um, great. Um, and I, I love that that work is happening. But um, after I became vegan, I felt like I needed to do something that had uh, more of a, a short-term uh, or near-term impact um, and many of the um, drugs that I was helping develop I wasn't working on them themselves but the tools I was providing to these companies were then being used to primarily develop drugs for lifestyle diseases and so then you you're in this sort of perpetual circle of inefficiency right where you're helping the industry create uh, drugs to treat diseases that are often caused by bad lifestyle choices, many of those being the foods that we eat. And I just felt like I wasn't making the best use of my time and talents. And then I was, you know, randomly searching the internet for um, things that I might be able to do that are a bit more impactful and came across um, the Good Food Institute. Um, and here um, we study both um, foods from plants and foods from um, stem cells, so-called clean meat or cell-based meat or cultured meat. It has many, many name, too many names. Um, and I had this, you know, this aha moment where, wow, I can combine my academic training in plants and this commercial experience that I've had um, working with with stem cells and all of the tools to turn those stem cells into some kind of tissue. And yeah, that was just this big aha moment. And then I, um, here I am, yeah, uh, about a year and a half later. Yeah. Wow, so what you move fast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your, glad, glad you do too, because the planet needs you and so do humans yeah. and your research. Can you, um, can you talk to us, you mentioned just a little bit about what clean meat is or cultured meat or cell, stem cell, what was the other? Cell-based meat. Cell-based meat. Cell can you Tell us what it, what is that? How does it get made? Is it, yeah, is it so, cruel? A lot of our listeners who are vegan already want to know, well, what does it do to the animals? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really new um, field. It was just um, in 2013 that a professor in the Netherlands called Mark Post um, created the first um, cell-based or cultured um, hamburger. And, and now there are um, over 30 companies around the world that are developing different types of um, food, meat from stem cells. And so the process that's used um, is taken from um, the regenerative medicine or cell therapy industry. And essentially you're taking some cells uh, via a biopsy. Uh, in this case, you would be taking them. Let, let's use um, a chicken um, as our example, right? So you would take a small biopsy of cells from a chicken, just like the bi type of biopsy that you would have if you went to a doctor's office. So um, it can be done under a local anesthetic and can be um, you know, pain-free for the, for the animal. Those cells are then taken and, um, and purified, and then they're expanded up. So one of the hallmarks of a stem cell is that it can divide many, many times and stay in a, in a state that's undifferentiated. So you can use that um, that ability to take a small number of cells that you took from this biopsy and create millions and, and billions of them. And so that's the first step of this process, which is often called proliferation. So you're taking a small number of cells and making many, many cells. 
um, and you feed the cells nutrients in this solution called cell culture media. You do this inside a big tank called a bioreactor, which if you've been to a, um, a microbrewery and you see those big um, metal tanks in the back, that's basically what this is. So you're growing the cells inside this big tank. Once you have enough of those undifferentiated cells, then you can change the conditions inside that tank um, and add different um, ingredients in, and that will cause the cells to change their, their, their fate. And in, in the case of cell-based meat or cultured meat, you're coaxing the cells to become the cells that make up meat, which are primarily muscle, fat, and different types of connective tissue. Um, so this process of taking stem cells and turning them into tissue, this has been done for the last you know, 10, 15 years in the medical industry to make, say, cardiac therapies or neural therapies. And now we're just borrowing this technology and adapting it for um, the food industry. So it's, it's the end product is meat, just like the meat that you would um, eat from a slaughtered animal, but it's identical in terms of the cells that are in it, the way it looks, the structure, but um, there's no slaughtering required. And in fact, you can um, take one biopsy of cells from an animal and create thousands and thousands of kilos of meat. Ultimately, when this industry is commercial, it is not yet commercial. Obviously, that's going to do extraordinary things for animals and the environment. Um, but what about our health? Yeah, it's a great question, right? So um, it's there. There are. I mean, it, essentially, it's the same. Uh, at least the first products will be the same, and that you know the nutritional. Uh, profile of say a, a cell-based um, hamburger is going to be the same as a, a a hamburger that was taken from a slaughtered cow. However, um, there's some important um, differences between the way uh, say a hamburger is produced through um, this process versus industrial animal agriculture. So you don't need antibiotics. Antibiotics are one are, are widely used in the industrial animal agriculture system. In fact. Um, there was a report that came out from the UK recently that said that um, the, the problem of antimicrobial resistance, which is a lot of that is caused by the overuse of antibiotics in the agricultural industry, is going to be a bigger problem than the climate change problem that we just spoke about. And in the year 2050, they project that this will, antimicrobial resistance will cost the world uh, in the region of $100 trillion to treat and be causing 10 million deaths a year. So this is worse than many of the disease, big diseases that we have today, right? And a lot of this is caused by, it's caused by overuse of antibiotics in humans as well, but that's, that's changing. But a lot of it is caused by um, the agricultural system. So we can eliminate that. And then a lot of the issue, other issues like foodborne um, diseases, you know, swine flu, um, the the spillage of like um, feces and other waste from these big, you know, farms into streams and things causing eutrophication. All of that disappears with um, with cell-based meat or clean meat. So um, the nutrition's probably the same, but there's huge um, benefits to the world in terms of health. Uh, yeah, in other other ways. That's so interesting, mm -hmm. especially about the. I think it's eighty percent of the antibiotics that are produced, uh, at least in this country, go to mm. uh, agriculture and go to, go to livestock. Um, so what I'm hearing from you then is that many, many, many animals will not have to be um, locked up and used for, the, for their life for beef, um, hopefully for dairy, we could talk about that. But they, so there'll be many fewer animals that will be exploited. But it sounds like you still do need, and this is for the ethical vegans, who are listening, who are still, um, who are, I mean, we, we've talked about this on our show and, the, and uh, people are really open to the idea of clean meat, but they might be a little less open, the vegans, if they knew that you still needed one animal per 100,000 pounds of meat. So I'm hoping that at some point you just need to go to your chicken who's happily in the, in the pasture in the backyard and just, you know, take a little swab from her cheek. Is that where y'all are sort of aiming for instead of having to have maybe thousands and thousands instead of hundreds of thousands of animals? Yeah, ultimately, I don't see um, there being a need for like farms of animals that um, you would need to take uh, cells from, right? It's, it's a couple of animals every so often to produce just massive amounts of meat because of the power of these 
these stem cells to produce many, many more cells and the, and the technology that's taken from the, from the pharmaceutical industry. It's a very efficient um, process. And I think ultimately when you think about plant-based meat and the amazing things that are happening there with some of these new newer plant-based meat products and the cell-based meat industry, I see no reason why um, in the future, um, in our lifetimes, we won't see um, a, a system where we we take meat from both of those sources and there's, there are no more of these um, massive um, destructive farms that house so many animals. Mm -hmm. Have you, um, Alexandra mentioned like the idea of clean dairy, obviously how we have a lot of wonderful plant-based versions. Um, I know of a, a, a wonderful company up in the Bay Area called Clara Foods. I've been to their, um, their laboratory and they are doing animal-free egg whites with yeast. You probably know of them and, and, you know, egg whites are used for anything from medicines, antibiotics, all the way to baking and, and obviously um, making food. Uh, are, are there any companies that are tackling clean dairy? Yeah, so there's a um, company just like Clara that's doing uh, the same on the on the dairy site called Perfect Day. So they're employing exactly the same processes mm -hmm. to um, take these proteins, um, the, the sequence of these proteins, put them inside a host system like yeast or bacteria and use this uh, process that's been used in the food and pharmaceutical industries for, for many, many years to produce these proteins synthetically. Um, so there's really exciting things happening both, uh, and there's another company called Geltor, which is making gelatin, synthetic gelatin. So wow. then that removes the need to um, extract that from animals as well and can be used both in cosmetics and in, and in food. So there's really exciting things happening in this recombinant protein space. What, can you tell everyone what gelatin is? Yeah, it comes from um, bones uh, and it's not a nice process, the, um, how it's produced. And it's used in so many uh, products, many candies, um, and other um, goods like that, jams and things have it in there as a kind of uh, a stabilizer um, for, for many food products. So it's, it's unfortunately the, you know, the agricultural industry has found uses for most parts of animals um, and profit from, from those and gelatin is one of those, but their gel tour is doing fantastic things. And uh, I, I see them really changing the way that we use products like that um, and using these synthetic methods to create them instead. So they're not taking cells, bone cells, and creating gel. No. They're taking plants and creating them from plants or from... S yeah, so in the case of these types of proteins, like, say, the egg proteins that Doxy mentioned or milk proteins or, or gelatin, uh, those proteins, um, it's like collagen. Um, these are... We know the sequence of those, the genetic sequence of those. So you can take that sequence and insert it inside what's called a, a, an expression system. And these are often yeast or bacteria. And then you put these, uh, these uh, bacteria or yeast inside, again, one of these big um, bioreactors that I mentioned before. And then you can produce massive amounts of these, um, these proteins through the use of these expression systems. So there's no animal involved at all um, in this process. And this is identical to, say, um, the way many drugs and vaccines are produced by pharmaceutical companies, or even um, the process for creating rennet that's used in cheese. Um, this uses that same process as well. So many people that, that eat cheese today don't realize that that actually employs this, this exact same process to create um, these synthetic proteins, and they're used widely in the food industry. So uh, what, do you, what do you say to people who are concerned about genetically modified organisms, and is there any kind of a comparison with uh, these cultured meats and uh, scientifically formulated dairy, et cetera? So these companies are using genetics to, um, you know, express this gene inside a host organism and then produce it. But this is a very a different uh, process, for example, to sort of traditional GMO crops where they were engineered to be resistant to um, a, a particular pesticide. Um, so it's, it's all the same type of um, technology where you're taking a sequence, a gene sequence, and you're inserting it into some type of host system. In the case of, you know, a GMO soy, 
you're introducing a gene that um, then makes those soy plants resistant to, say, Roundup. Um, and that's, you know, what Monsanto did. The, the technology itself, I believe, is, is very good. It, has, it can be used for very good things, right? You can create um, genetically modified plants that um, are more nutritious or more stable in environments that, where it's hard to grow crops. Um, but it, it has been used, I think, in ways that perhaps were not um, the most ethical um, by certain companies. Um, but the problem is, I think, there's a lack of understanding of the science and this connection with everything genetically modified with some of the bad things that have happened in that industry. But I think there, are, um, on, on the sort of balance on the science side, there's many, many good things that can happen. Um, but with the cell-based meat that I mentioned, that uh, most of the companies now... They may be using this technology for research purposes, but their uh, goals, at least for their first products, I believe, are not to use any kind of genetically um, engineered cells. I think the yes, you're right. The, <clears throat> with Monsanto, is especially egregious because what they did was basically, for our listeners who don't know, create plants that weren't healthier but could just resist weeds, uh, uh, sorry, resist pesticides so that Monsanto could just spray willy-nilly as much as they wanted to kill all the weeds they wanted and their precious food that they were going to sell to us to eat wouldn't be wouldn't be affected wouldn't die also right although yeah that's could very well that's be right. affected because it's full of roundup yeah and in in theory it's a you know it's a good thing that you can grow more crops and grow them more productively um i i just think the way it was perhaps the way it was handled and the way the public was educated and then there's some i think some problems with um roundup itself that i'm i'm not a an expert in that area but i think that's just a it's a unfortunately a very bad and prominent example of a very good technology i think mm. which can be used for 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 very good things, um, particularly for in this area that we're talking about, both for plant-based foods and and on this uh, cellular agriculture side as well. I think there's there's a there are a lot of very good reasons for what you're doing. The other concern I have, and, and tell me if this has come up at all, is that we're taking food and we're putting it in the hands of companies and taking it out of the hands of in individuals. Even though I know a lot of our farms are not owned by individuals anymore, but there is that thought too that we're now going to become just utterly dependent for our nutrition on these faceless, large capitalistic companies. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I see it that way. There certainly are some big um, corporations, food, food companies that are um, investing in this new area, like the plant-based meat um, uh, and plant-based eggs and dairy. But I think that um, when you look at, um, I there are also many small companies I think that are doing um, really great things as well and what this is doing as well if you look at the plant-based let's take plant-based uh, meat eggs and dairy so most of the products that exist today uh, use wheat and soy as their primary ingredients but what's happening is that we're now starting to see the industry explore other crops like pea and fava bean and lupin and what this allows the farms to do is diversify um, the crops that they're growing and actually uh, start to add in more of these these higher value crops to their um, to their farms you're right that many of the big farms that grow you know soy and wheat for would primarily for um, livestock feed are not um, owned by you know just a, a family um, but I think this is change this will change because of this because we'll need more diverse ingredients and these products are going to be used not to um, feed the you know whole food plant-based vegan but to feed meat eaters that like the taste of meat that like the taste of eggs and dairy but want to do want to choose food that is more ethically um, correct, more sustainable. Um, so I, I see overall this being a very positive thing where we're still going to be growing crops um, in small farms um, and we can still eat, you know, quinoa and um, black beans and rice and all those great things and kale, the things we love. But there's now going to be a much more healthy, much more sustainable option for uh, people that like to eat meat, eggs and dairy and I think that's going to allow farmers and small companies to profit as well in the future and big companies, but hopefully they'll be a little bit more ethical in some of the decisions they make. I, I, uh, 
to hear um, some mainstream folks, let's say, um, that say that insects are the future of protein. <laughs> what, what, what do you say to them so, so that I know what to say to them? <laughs> Selfish. Yeah, so I, I think I would say a, cu a couple things. Um, one, I think um, most of the market research that I've seen doesn't show that um, insect protein is going to grow um, uh, significantly, at least compared to plant proteins. And I think there's a sort of ick factor associated with that, that many people, particularly in the West, are not um, that interested in eating um, a lot of insect protein. Um, maybe they want it in a you know an energy bar or like a protein powder and it it kind of stops there i think that's what all of the market research suggests but also it's um often claimed as a a really sustainable source of protein but um in most cases that data comes from comparing it to cattle um which is cattle are the most inefficient of um of animal-based protein sources, um, but actually when you compare insects to other animal sources or even or particularly plants, um, plants are way more um, efficient. So the amount of sort of energy in that you need to produce uh, a certain number of calories of plants is less than um, the same requirements for, for growing, say, you know, insect, insect protein. Plus, there's still the cruelty aspect. I mean, cruelty That's right. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. even mention that. Uh, you, um, right. So many, I guess many people obvious. still think it's, uh, you know, that in, believe that insects are sentient uh, beings. And so, you know, by housing them in these big industrial farms, just like you are chickens and cows, yeah. that you're inflicting um, torture on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where are we with clean meat? in terms of getting it to the marketplace and clean dairy these all the the good food institute you are a you encourage smaller companies to develop these or any company to develop these products right yeah so we exist to accelerate both the plant-based and cell-based meat eggs and dairy industry and we do that through four main areas so we have a policy arm so we have a, a team of lawyers and policy experts that work um, with the government and with a lot of these companies to create a fair regulatory playing field um, in the future, right? So a lot of these, you know, labeling issues that you've been reading about in, in the U.S. where, you know, certain um, states are trying to prevent the use of the word meat to describe a plant-based meat product um, and dairy, uh, there's dairy issues as well. So we do a lot of that. Um, we also work with big and small uh, companies. So we work with many of the biggest food companies to help them understand why they should be investing more in this in this new industry, why they should be moving away from animal-based proteins to plant or cell-based proteins. We also work with many of the startups and entrepreneurs in this space, so helping them figure out their business plans, connecting them with investors, and really helping them grow into uh, successful companies. And then my team, um, we focus on the science, so we try to look and see where there are technical barriers to moving this industry forward quickly um, and then work with the scientific community both in academia and in, in companies to find solutions to those problems and then also fund research as well. Um, we, we actually funded $3 million worth of research this year into plant-based meat and cell-based meat. Um, which is super exciting. Um, so yeah, all of that that exists to kind of push this industry forward as, as quickly as possible, both on the plant side and, and the cell uh, base side. And so, uh, Idazi, I think you need to introduce Grace Min to the political arm that they have <laughs> yeah. so that they can go to talk to her about changing, making sure the USDA changes their their food plate. Okay, I'm on it. Okay. Something right. tells me yeah. they're on it so, already. But um. so where are we? Where are we in terms of clean meat? Yeah. Can I will I be able to purchase it next year? Or clean dairy or any of these products that you're working with? So on the on the clean or cell based side, I think it's gonna be a while um, before we see meat products that you can buy, you know, easily in a grocery store. I you know if you listen to some of the companies there projecting that they'll be able to launch um, a product uh, at a, like a high-end restaurant, right? The costs are still very high. So I think we'll see maybe in the next couple of years, some of the companies releasing products in, in fancy restaurants that only a few people can afford to eat. But then it's just going to, um, the costs are just going to come down, um, just like any technology, right? If you look at the, the first iPhone, it was ridiculously expensive. And now 
um, many people can afford those. And I think we'll see the same with sell with clean meat. But it's I think it's a ways off before you know you're going to be buying it in in your grocery store. Um, and on the plant, but on the plant-based side, um, as you probably know, that's changing rapidly already, right? There's been this shift from, I think, products that were made just for vegans, um, you know, sort of traditional plant-based burgers um, that most meat eaters wouldn't want to eat to these products, kind of pushed by the um, emergence of Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat that have created products that are designed for meat eaters, but are made from plants. And that is revolutionizing this industry and we're seeing much more of a sort of science focused food tech approach to these um, plant-based meat egg and dairy products and i think that it's already growing rapidly but it's just it's not going to stop that's that's there's a snowball effect happening now um and that's super exciting i think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg with what um these companies can do with plants to recreate um uh, meat products and egg and dairy products, and they're just going to get better. Mm-hmm. As as this industry continues to grow at such a rapid pace, specifically uh, the work that is is happening in, in clean meat, clean dairy, clean eggs, um, do you see more specific courses um, in food science that are going to pop up at university? And are there are going there going to be many more jobs for young people like the job that you have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, even now, there's um, there's actually a there's in if you look on the clean meat uh, side, there are multiple jobs available for scientists and and uh, marketing folks, um, and there's actually a, a dearth of talent. So we need more and more scientists and other professionals moving into this industry, and I think that's just that's going to just increase and. Um, on the course side, for sure, we actually, um, one of the uh, scientists in my team teaches a course on this subject at Stanford University. Um, there's another course at Berkeley, yeah. um, and we actually have our own online course on um, plant-based, the science of plant-based meat and cell-based meat that um, any of your listeners can sign up and take for free if they're interested in getting into the, into the weeds a little bit. I think I'm interested in the weeds. <laughs> it's no more Roundup. <laughs> that is so exciting. What are you working on right now at GFI that you're most excited about? Yeah, so I mentioned the um, the research that we funded. So um, that it, this year has been, I think, one of the most impactful things we've done. So we, uh, we released our call for proposals at the end of last year, and we had um, 66 um, applications come in from 18 different countries um, and we ended up funding 14 research projects um, for uh, three million dollars in total and our plan is to do that on an annual basis so this year we're going to be uh, I hope in the fall of this year releasing another call for proposals with uh, more money and all of this research is open source right so when these uh, scientists create solutions to some of the technical problems in this industry They'll release that data, they'll publish papers, and then that can be used by the industry as a whole to move um, things on even more quickly. So I'm super excited about um, the next round of that happening. And then some of the analytical work we're doing to sort of model uh, the future scenarios of this industry to understand, you know, how, if you think about the supply chain, right, and all of the inputs that are needed to produce, say, plant-based dairy, uh, plant-based milk products, um, making sure we understand how that the industry is going to change and what new developments need to happen to ensure that we can continue to grow. Um, right, plant-based milk in the U.S. commands like a 13% uh, market share right now. We want that to be 100%. Right. So, how? What are the obstacles in the way? So, we're doing a lot of modeling, um, scenario modeling, to try and understand what those might be, and then bring in folks from industry and from academia to. Um, find solutions to those barriers. Can you talk, give me a couple examples of what that might be, some of the barriers that you've come up with? Yeah, so it might be the equipment that's used. So if I use um, if I use plant-based meat as an example, so um, in order to create that sort of texturized um, mouthfeel that you get when you say you bite into a, like a plant-based chicken breast or a plant-based burger, um, what's often used is this uh, equipment called an extruder, and that applies high heat and high uh, pressure 
to plant proteins and it sort of elongates them so they be, they get that fibrous structure that you see inside uh, uh, an animal product, but also in some of these plant-based products. Those are super expensive um, pieces of equipment. Um, and so if you model out, like, you know, you want the plant-based meat industry to have, say, a 60% market share um, in the future, how many of those pieces of equipment are you going to need? Um, how many companies are you going to need to build those? What type of um, resources are going to be required? So that's that's one example of what we're trying to do is these, these um, future modeling scenarios. Wow. Well, I think that we have to have you on every six months because your industry and what you're doing is moving so fast that we need to keep up to date because this has been just mind blowing and so exciting. And thank you for the work that you do. No, thank you for what you guys are doing too. I think I agree. This is a super exciting um, field and um, I'm, I'm so happy that I'm part of it and can talk at least a little bit about it with, with you guys and your listeners. Yeah, no doubt. And thank you for your support. David was one of the first people to ever email me about Switch for Good and just oh, f- encouraging word. Athlete, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. And check out um, David's Instagram. It's Plant Powered Running. It's one of my favorite accounts. So because we didn't really get to go deep into his um, athleticism. We touched on it at the beginning, but yeah. um, he's a, a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. So uh, thanks for your support and your belief in us, David. You're very welcome. And um, I would appreciate some cheers. Um, so not this weekend, but next weekend I'm running a 100-mile race down in Virginia. So um, okay. you can you can cheer me on then. Excellent. Okay. You've got it. <laughs> Always. Bye-bye, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Bye.